points. First of all, in case you haven't noticed, there's a wonderful um, copy of the presentation in your um, in your bo uh, booklet. So if you want to follow along, I'm not, I don't believe in reading slides, uh, so it'll also give you a chance to take notes. Uh, secondly, I only have about a half an hour, and even though I've prepared some examples to illustrate this, I think my key role here is to get across a concept and a framework for thinking about scaling up, and so I may end up skipping the examples, and so I hope you'll excuse me in advance for that. And last but not least, uh, I'm going to be here through Friday, and so even though I'm only formally talking today, I help organizations draft, design, and implement scaling up strategies for a living. And so I really hope uh, you'll take advantage if you find something I say useful of my presence. I'm happy to meet with you at breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe even the gym, uh, to discuss any of the challenges, opportunities, or questions you may have, particularly the missions, but anybody here in terms of if I can be of any help, I'd really be delighted. So uh, the structure of the presentation is basically I'm going to try to give you some of the big picture issues we'd like to uh, keep in mind and then share with you the framework and then um, how to think about this and some of the key lessons uh, come back to that. I'm, I was sort of raised in the tell them what you're going to say, say it and tell them what you said at uh, school of presentations. So first of all, in terms of the big picture and how uh, the things that we need to keep in mind, first of all, I just want to make it clear, I don't think anybody, whether it's in USAID or otherwise, believes that everything should be scalable. There are certain programs that simply are appropriate for certain small scale. Certain communities have unique qualities or demographics or beneficiaries or types of poverty that are either relatively unique or that we really particularly want to prioritize and just need to keep that in mind because I think there's deservedly pressure for scaling but that doesn't mean it should be scaled to everything and everywhere. And similarly, as circumstances and, and context changes, a model that may work well in one environment or one context or space doesn't necessarily work elsewhere and we need to really keep in mind uh, not only what works, but where and why it works as we move from one place to another. Uh, secondly, as Julie and Richard, uh, Richard the first maybe, um, have emphasized, um, there are multiple pathways to scaling up. Scan there is no one right way to scale up. And even though we have a heavy emphasis in FDF on scaling up in partnership with the private sector, uh, there are going to be instances where the public sector will play an important role, where universities will play a role. Many of you in the audience uh, and participating uh, with its international centers or elsewhere. And so, in fact, one of the key characteristics of scaling up is that no matter how many different ways you may think about doing it, it's almost always a multi-stakeholder process. And that's a really key concept because it basically means that it usually takes us out, our, out of our comfort zone because we can't control it. We have to get other people engaged and enlisted to move it forward. Uh, in terms of, not only are there not one right way to scale up, but it almost always requires trade-offs. There is no perfect way. What are some of the trade-offs? And one of the ones I really want to make explicit is between scale and impact. There's often a tendency, especially in countries in Southeast Asia where the populations are very large, when you go from you know, three districts or whatever the local districts are called or counties or uh, provinces or regions to a larger area that you're affecting, there's a tendency to lose quality and fidelity. And how do we trade that off? How do we, how do we put in place on the one hand as much as we can to, a, to make sure quality, does everybody understand what I mean by fidelity? What I mean by that is we did it a certain way at small scale and we want to make sure as much as possible we do it the same way at large scale or else we can't uh, necessarily claim that we'll get the same results. So how do we ensure that when we don't have control, when we're passing control on to the private sector, to the public sector, to NGOs, who are going to be involved in implementing these fabulous innovations that you've all been working on sustainably. So that's a big challenge. Similarly, there's the challenge between fidelity and adaptation. On the one hand, as I said, as we move from context to context, we may need to change things. What worked, you know, especially if you're in a country like India, where it's actually not really a country, it's a continent. There are 36 different uh, states, and each of them has its own culture, often its own language, its own um, uh, uh, different ways of doing things. And I'm not just talking about agroecological zones. One of the things I was particularly pleased to see is the heavy emphasis on gender in Feed the Future. 
Now, at least I've been in development long enough to know that back in the day, 20 years ago, I think people were really annoyed at gender and thought it was a check-the-box exercise, but nobody really took it seriously. And I'm glad to see that I think we've moved well beyond that. And I think particularly in scaling up agricultural innovations, gender is absolutely vital because in many cases, women are the majority of the farmers, and their ability to access finance, to have economic power, and to make decisions varies dramatically often across different parts of the country. So something that works in one part of a country where women are very empowered may not work elsewhere or may need to be adapted to take into account the changes in gender roles, gender power, and, and cultural and social context. And so keeping gender front and sector, center is a very key aspect of as we, we balance fidelity and adaptation. The three challenges of which they, there are many in scaling up that I want to highlight are first of all, it's about aligning incentives. There's a, a, a appropriately a emphasis in scaling up on in Feed the Future on value chains. That means that everybody up and down the value chain has to have a reason or an incentive to agree to do play the role that you're hoping they'll play if scale is to be affected. Why should farmers use the seed? Why should they adopt this new crop? Why should the policy environment become more supportive? Okay, one of the things I love is that we all are, well, I won't, I'll speak for myself. I'm a believer in evidence-based policy making and that we should only scale up things that have evidence. But as someone who's had the privilege of studying with George Arkelhoff and Danny Kahneman, both of whom won Nobel Prizes in behavioral economics, one of the things we now know in the last 20 years of economic research is that people actually are systematically non-rational in how they make decisions. Most of them do not read the published journals. Most of them actually don't know or care that the impact of this seed variety was statistically significant at three decimal points. Okay? Believe it or not, they may, they, they, I was working in China recently for IFAD on scaling up several innovations there, one of which was, I don't know what you would call it, it wouldn't really be livestock, it was scaling up guinea pig production. And no, they don't use them as pets. Okay. And, um, and when I asked people in the community why they had decided to adopt the guinea pig production that the one person in their village had started doing, you know what the answer was? It was because they saw this person buying more clothes. They were all women. Okay, not that men might not have seen the same thing. Okay, but this the person clearly had more disposable income and was bought, had a new house, had a new car, and had uh, consumers goods that they couldn't afford, and that's why they did it. Not because they thought that the guinea pigs were a good thing, or that, that she was raising more guinea pigs, because they saw her consumption level increase. And I've noticed that in several of the innovations that we're considering, such as Bangladesh's emphasis on new seed varieties, there's a big emphasis on these packets of, of giving people seeds. So what, part of our, and I'll come back to this later, but I really want to emphasize this, that part of your innovation is not simply the technology, what I'll call the what, but also the how. How is it that the various actors become uh, um, informed about this, knowledgeable about this, and make the decision to play the role you want, whether it's supplying the seeds, if they're a seed producer, growing the fingerlings, if it's a fish production, adopting them, um, decide if they're a miller, milling the, the rice in their, in their mill, if there needs to be changes in the enabling and policy environment. I hate to break it to you, but most politicians and policymakers don't make the decision based on evidence. They make it because they want to get reelected. They make it because it increases their bureaucratic budget. They make it because, it, I hate to say it, but often increases uh, opportunities for cronyism or patronage. Okay, so it may be more compelling to the various actors to understand what their incentives are and what criteria they use in making decisions than uh, speaking uh, simply that there's a cost benefit, that this is going to be, you get more seeds, you'll make more money, all that. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So a key aspect is this multi stakeholder quality of scaling up and how do we align the incentives up and down the value chain, including policymakers and partners. Okay. Um, the second question is, who can do this at scale? Right. It's one thing to put out an RFP, get a contractor, bring some fantastic organization like FinTrack or IFPRI or ERI in, and uh, with a great COP and implement a project. Okay. At scale, we can't do it as a project. It's be most of the time it's beyond the size of a project. 
And we have to engage with other actors and other stakeholders and make sure that they have the capacity to do what is necessary. So scaling up is not just about the innovation, but it's a tension between making sure that the systems that we're engaging with have the capacity and the incentives to deliver this at scale. And how do we do that in a way that's reasonable without um, thinking that we're going to remake or strengthen the entire agricultural value chain system in a country of several hundred million people, which would clearly be beyond our means. So what's enough system strengthening or capacity building? Not too much, not too little. Where do we, how do we address that? And finally, I just want to emphasize the finances. Um, historically, there's been a tendency of, I, I once, I've done several evaluations for USAID, and I remember seeing one, it was for scaling up actually, in which a previous evaluator had said, um, this is a, a scalable thing because the co unit cost, which was about uh, four or $5,000 per beneficiary, was lower than in other USAID projects. And I thought to myself, okay, four or $5,000 per person is about 10 times per capita GDP. Okay, is this really feasible within, this happened to be a, a livelihoods empowerment uh, process, really feasible within the government budget constraint or the capacity of pay for beneficiaries? which would have been 10 times both, okay? So one of the key constraints is who's gonna pay for this? We have basically two solutions, right? Either it's gonna come out of the public sector or various private sector actors, whether they're farmers, are gonna buy it uh, or make money off it. So if this doesn't fit within their financial incentives or fiscal constraint, this is not a scalable project, okay, or scalable innovation, okay? So that leads uh, me to, uh, let's get into some of the details here. Okay, which is, it is about the money, but it's more about, not just the money, which is about reach and impact. And I really want to emphasize that, that there is, I mentioned it before, uh, so, so if I'm saying it twice, there's a reason for that, which is a tendency to go for scale and lose impact. And how do we have both? Secondly, as I said, most of the time scaling is beyond the impact of a single project. And it means we need to start to think about more of a programmatic approach to these things. And I know this has been a debate in development for those of you who are as old as I am for 20, 30 years now. Is it programmatic? Is it uh, a project? But scaling up is very difficult to do project by project. Because it's, projects don't necessarily have the scope. And, and the third thing I want to emphasize is that at least for the next two and a half days, my understanding from Julie and Ed and the uh, Bureau of Food Security and USAID is that our definition of scaling up we're using includes sustainability. It isn't simply about we went from 20,000 beneficiaries to a million beneficiaries and then we walked away. It's that we came back three years later and it was still there. Okay? And so I want to disaggregate that or pa unpack that into three subcomponents of uh, sustainability. First of all is political or you could use the word incentives. If, if the public sector is playing a, uh, an important role, let's not just depend upon one particular minister or champion or de director because we all know that those people change, okay? So how can we make sure whether it's this political party or this individual in a key decision-making role that regardless of who it is that's bought in and bought on and, and been a leader and a champion of this, that this program or this innovation will continue to exist as those people change. And whether that's someone in the public sector or the private sector, the, there are institutional incentives for it to change, and not just because somebody particularly likes this, or you went to graduate school at Michigan State with that person 30 years ago, and they bought it because they like you, okay? Second, it's about organizational and financial sustainability. And I've kind of already touched on these, but just want to repeat, once you go away, do the organizations that are going to implement this, the farmers, the agricultural extension agents, the seed producers, the fingerling hatcheries, et cetera, et cetera, have the capacity to continue to do this once the technical assistance and the capacity building is still gone? Do they have the capacity and do they have the incentive? And so that gets into the finances. Do they have the incentive and motivation? Are they going to make money from this or is it going to align with the other things that drive them to do it? If we don't have alignment of organizational capacity, financial or non-financial incentives, and the politics of it, this scaling up doesn't sustain itself. Okay? Now, the <clears throat> I just want to emphasize that scaling up, as I think you've started to get, is as much about the politics or the incentives. It's not simply a, a, an engineering problem that needs to be solved. 
So we did it with 10,000, now we're going to do it with 50,000. We distributed 100 packets of seeds, now we're going to distribute 10,000 packets of seeds. Because what's key about scaling up um, is that we have to have a business model, right? Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to deliver this? Who's going to produce this? Who's going to buy this? How does the ecosystem all fit together? Okay? And those business models are not, it's not an engineering problem because the, all those actors have to make decisions and buy in and, and agree to play their role. We need to know who the customer is and why the customer is going to buy it. And so uh, I'll be deliberately provocative, which is scaling up, therefore, is not the same as project management. It isn't linear. Okay? One of the things we're going to introduce in a minute is the concept of pathways, drivers, and spaces. The pathway is how do you do it? What, what pathway are we going to take to scale? Are we going to work with the private sector primarily, public sector, NGOs, or are, they, are we going to work with all of them and they're going to play different roles? So the pathway is who's going to play the roles of funding, financing, delivering, supplying, etc. That's the pathway. Okay. And then there's the spaces. Well, okay, if somebody's going to be involved in delivery, do they have the organizational capacity, i.e. organizational space, to do it? And if not, how do we create it? And last but not least, what's going to drive that? Why is that organization that's supposed to do the supply, the provide the seeds or, or hatch the fingerlings going to do what they're going to do? What's going to drive that? Who's going to lead that? Who's going to expose them? What are their incentives, etc.? And I'll come back to this, so don't worry about that. But my first point is that we may decide that one pathway makes sense, but then when we look at the spaces and the incentives and the leadership and the drivers, that doesn't make sense. So we may need to iterate between, what, should we do it this way? Well, does the space and the enabling environment support that way? And in fact, we're going to spend some time on that later today on cost-benefit analysis of the different pathways. All right? So the point is, there isn't one right way. Secondly, there are winners and losers. Okay? If you think about seed production, we introduce new seeds. What ha unless they're the same people who are producing them that have the old, who are producing the old seeds, the old su seed suppliers lose. And they may fight uh, or resist the introduction of the new seeds, and they may often be established vested interests that are going to lose from this. So how do you identify, that almost, you'd like to think, I think we'd all like to think, well, we're doing good here. We're reducing poverty, we're improving incomes, we're improving the role of women, we're increasing nutrition, we're producing health outcomes. Who could be against that? And the answer is lots of people. Okay? So let's not be naive about this, but let's be very clear who the winners or losers are. And whether it's public sector or private sector, there are key stakeholders that are going to help lead and drive this because it's there in their interests, and there are others that may oppose this. Okay? And how can we um, marshal and motivate those who are likely to be the winners and either, excuse me for speaking frankly, but co-opt, collaborate with, or even uh, win over the potential losers? Okay, so um, that's a big difference than the normal project. Okay, as I said, it's multi-stakeholder, but one of the key questions is who's in charge? Who is going to lead this? And how, especially if it's an almost always a multi-stakeholder collaborative process, how do you align the different interests and make sure that they move forward? Okay, whereas in a standard project, there's the chief of party, they've got their team, there's the two or three maybe sub-implementers, or if it's a grant-based thing. I mean, you know, you know the drill, at least most of you from USAID. No, we don't have the kind of ownership uh, and control that we do in a project. So how do we move this forward um, by, getting all the, by hurting all those cats and getting their interests aligned uh, so that they move forward? Because that's a characteristics. Okay? And secondly, as I alluded to, usually, um, how many of you are economists by training? including agricultural, a lot, okay. So I'll talk a little jargon, okay. Small scale is partial equilibrium, right? Okay, so you can, you know, introduce a new sea variety or a new kind of this or a new kind of that, horticulture or plant crop or livestock or fish, and it's not going to affect the price of those things. As you go to scale, it will. And I noticed several of your scaling strategies noted that. Similarly, okay, it's not going to affect labor supply and labor demand. Uh, but at scale, it will affect those things. So some of the key skills for scaling up is thinking about what are the large-scale implications in terms of labor supply, labor supply, commodity prices, input prices, supply chain capacity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And how do you make sure that the system works because you're working at that level? Okay. 
So as I figured, I'm going to run out of time. All right, so I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Um, by the way, I'm sharing these different concepts and categories with you, not because I expect you to walk the talk, but be, or talk the right talk and use them appropriately, though that would be nice. But hopefully that will be useful so that we can create a common language among, and set of concepts among ourselves so we can have a coherent conversation. Because one of the challenges in scaling up is about what do we all mean by that. It's one of those words that almost everybody uses that means something different. Okay? So if I get to uh, what are the different types of scaling up, one is just filling it in, which is that we have our zone of influence. We've only hit half the people there. Let's hit the other half. Another is to take it to other places or other types of people, and that can be either done horizontally. So often I've seen, for example, in my work with EFAD, going from uh, farmer to farmer. Oh, my next door neighbor is growing this new sea variety. He's doing better. I want the same thing. Or vertically, which is the government or some other uh, a center, a university introduces it top down, or both, where we try to leverage both community connections or top uh, or some sort of top down approach. And finally, a whole different approach to scaling up is functional scaling up, which is where you <coughs> add components to the model. So the first three are how do you change the scale? The other thing is you actually scale up the model. So for example, you may decide that uh, sorry, some of your th uh, models that we can't scale up a new variety of rice if we also don't provide assistance to the rice millers and the rice harvesters and post-harvest production. So it isn't just a, it's not just a variety, it's other parts of the value chain. That would be scaling up, up and down the value chain, but not necessarily going to more places and more people. And again, many of your innovations do both. So this is the big slide, and I'll try in my limited time to go through this as best I can. So the thing we want to think about is what's the pathway for scaling up? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to deliver it? Who's going to approve it or buy into it or, or buy it, as the case may be, up and down the value chain? And um, that's the pathway. Okay? For that pathway to work, there needs to be space for scaling up. So if we look at these one at a time, can you all hear me? No. Yeah? Okay. We've talked about the money. Now you want to use the microphone. I'll use the microphone. Recording. Great idea. Okay. So we've talked about the money. Okay. Who's going to pay for it? Public sector, private actors, why is it in their interest? If the money doesn't exist, we have to create that space. We either have to lobby or advocate for sufficient fiscal space in the public sector, or we have to work with the private sector to either say, how can we make this a profitable uh, engagement for people on the supply side and the demand side, whether it's people producing seeds or fingerlings or people who are purchasing them. The organizational space. Do the various people involved in implementation and delivery have the capacity to do that? If they not, or those organizations, we either need to pick different organizations, change the pathway, or do capacity building. Policies, I think, is pretty clear. If the enabling environment doesn't work, if there isn't the support of policy, so for example, maybe there aren't appropriate standards for these particular crops or uh, seed varieties or fish, how do we change the standards and move back? And what are the political incentives for all those actors? Why should they change the policy? Okay, I make money because I get kickbacks from the person who has the sole monopoly on the one seed variety. Okay, why should I promote a, a more a sustainable enabling environment? Environment in this case actually means agro environment. So um, is the space conducive? And the partnership space. Because I think the key emphasis on Feed the Future is on a collaborative approach of public sector, private sector, donors, and NGOs. How, what are the incentives of all those partners and how can we leverage that? And once we have identified the spaces and the pathway, how are we going to drive that process? Who's going to lead it to be the champions? Um, is there sufficient demand? And if there's not, um, how are we going to create those things? So I think we can ask ourselves, as USAID, what are we doing, not simply to create proven and tested uh, innovations, but what are we doing to create the drivers and spaces that will push scaling up and allow scaling up to happen? Okay. Now, the one thing I particularly want to emphasize, because I think um, I'm a bit of a contrarian, I hope that's okay. Uh, or you can uh, you could take what I say with a grain of salt here. But when I speak to an audience which I think has a strong technology background, it's important to remember that these innovations are not just about the what, the seed variety, but the how. Okay? Why do people adopt this? 
how do you get farmers to agree to do this? How do you uh, uh, work in these communities if women uh, don't have the right gender power motivation uh, or their or the, uh, economic decision making is made mostly by men to uh, you've done something that allows them to have the gender space, the power to make decisions, okay? So the how is important as the what. And particularly how customers learn about your product and how the product is delivered by whom is as important as the product yourself. You all know this, but I don't want you to forget, okay? You take a value chain approach, let's take it seriously. It isn't simply about we run around with a helicopter and drop seeds from the sky, okay? It's, we have a whole set of institutions that produce them, deliver them, provide technical assistance, pro provide follow-up. Um, we have a whole system of how we persuade farmers or what's in it for them, etc., etc. Those are as important as the technologies and innovations themselves. Okay? So if we think about scaling up, this is sort of the short version of drivers and spaces. There's the innovation itself. There's the goal. So what do we mean by scale? How many people? How many places? And our zone of influence? What impact will it have, not just directly on agricultural production, but indirectly on nutrition and other things? Who is going to play the key roles? Who is going to deliver this in the, in the supply chain? Who is going to apply this? Who is going to provide technical assistance and support? Do they have the organizational capacity? I don't know if you can read this. And how are the finances going to work? And why are all these actors, particularly from the pathway, going to do what they're supposed to do? Okay? If this system isn't aligned and coherent, you don't have a successful scaling up strategy, right? If you don't have the right actors playing the key roles capable of working at this scale and achieving this impact with their aligned incentives, it doesn't work. So one way you create a scaling up strategy, and I can help you with this, is to make sure that all these pieces fit together. That what the nature of the innovation can produce the goals we want at scale. These actors can deliver the right pathway. They have the capacity, the finances, and the incentives make sense. That's, in other words, there's a, there's a business model at scale. So I think I'm running out of time, if I thought I would. So let me just go over a few lessons. First of all, one of the things we need to be careful about is using existing delivery mechanisms, okay? That's the right thing to do. But often, the reason we have poverty is precisely because those existing pathways tend to be biased towards people who already are well off. Okay? So what do I mean by that? Okay? We all know that as you get into more and more remote areas of the countries you work in, whether it's Cambodia or Nepal or Bangladesh, the presence of agricultural extension agents, the presence of supply chains, the, uh, the presence of post-harvest uh, production and uh, et cetera, et cetera, are weaker and weaker. So if we simply introduce it into these existing chains and institutions, the same people who don't get access now won't get access then. So we need to make sure that the rest of the supply chain, the rest of the value chain is in place. Okay? So how do we either strengthen it or create new ones? Okay? Second is it's important to identify as early as possible in the process what is the pathway you're going to use because we want to make sure that our strategy is aligned uh, with that pathway. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is that, um, as I've talked about, there are financial or fiscal constraints. So if the ability of farmers to buy the seeds is constrained because they don't have liquidity or they don't have access to finances, then we have to do one of two things. We either have to change the cost of the seeds or we have to create financing mechanisms. Right? So thinking about those things up front, as opposed to we don't worry about that, and we simply want a technological fix, it was, hey, here's a more productive variety of rice, then we end up with something that's not scaled. So the earlier we understand the requirements of the technology in terms of financing um, and uh, technical assistance and knowledge, the more we can build that into our scaling model. So not just the what, but the how. Okay. And move, I've already talked about moving from innovations to pathways to spaces. So just a couple other things is, who's going to lead the scaling up effort? Okay, what does scaling up take? I like to think of it as an intermediary organization. Okay, so is that going to be somebody who is implementing the pro, a pro, not USA project? Or what? Somebody has to take care of demonstration, marketing, and demand creation, right? 
somebody has to, if the costs are not aligned, either improve the cost efficiency and also make sure it works in different places. Whether there are different gender roles, different agroclimactic conditions, different politics, different institutional uh, uh, support mechanisms, such as more or less agricultural extension, etc. Okay? Somebody has to do the advocacy, whether with the public sector or market to the private sector. What's in it for them? Okay? Somebody has to create and coordinate all the partnerships we're talking about. Now, clearly, uh, USA and BFS is doing a fabulous job because look who's here. Okay? But how do we do that at the local level? How do we do that on the district by district level? Okay? Making sure all those actors are working together effectively, build capacity, and strengthen the enabling environment. These is a, this is the short list of the two, three, four, five, the six different things that somebody in scaling up has to be taken care of. Okay? And that requires leadership. Okay? And the other drivers. How are we going to get this knowledge out there? Who are going to be the champions? Not just within USAID or uh, a project uh, team, but outside, <coughs> other partners. How are we going to um, how are we going to leverage or create demand, and how are we going to align with the motivation of the political, bureaucratic, and market actors who are involved? So, uh, thank you very much. I hope I didn't speak too fast. I just want you to know that I do scaling up myself not only as a living, but I have twin girls. Um, and so, um, so, I practice what I preach at home. Okay. Um, I have plenty of cards, but this is how you can get in touch with me. As I said, I will be around. Uh, throughout the entire workshop and beyond the next few days, and please come and talk to me at any time. And in the back of your um, copy of my presentation are some references that you might find useful. Uh, so if you have trouble sleeping at night and you want to read a scale about scaling up, you know, it's, I've been told there are um, evidence-based randomized controlled trials that this works better than any drug on the market. It was reading a scaling up strategy. <laughs> okay. It's uh, proven the fact that we're jealous. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.